Good afternoon to you. Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. It is Thursday, the 8th day of April 2021, and we have the April Outlook to talk about from Dr. Phil Klotzbach. Now, as many of you are watching this, I'm sure you already know the end of the story, so to speak, the punchline, the numbers, the total numbers. But what we're going to do here is kind of break it down and explain it a little bit and maybe shed some light on what I call the keys to the game, things to look for. We never think of hurricane season as a game. I want to make that very clear, but it's just my analogy here. Sports and hurricanes, it's easy for people to understand that. Some things to look for, keys to the game. That's why I say that. Uh, so we'll look at the numbers, the raw stuff, if you will, and then we're going to break it down and kind of give you some homework to do, things to look for over the weeks and months ahead. All right, all right, and by the way, I'm doing this on a Thursday. I've been off for a while because I went on vacation with my family. We went to the desert southwest. It was nice out there, nice and above normal temperatures. Saw some interesting things, uh, you know, part of my interest in geography and climate and all that, mixing it up with a family vacation, and it was nice. But it's good to be back, and so as such, let's get on with it, shall we? All right, so here's the tweet. From Dr. Klotzbach, Colorado State University, calling for uh, an above-average season once again with 17 named storms, eight of those named storms becoming hurricanes, and four of those hurricanes becoming major hurricanes. So pretty busy season forecast, not unexpected. We think uh, we know enough about how the climate works now, the ocean-atmosphere relationship, that in early April we can get a pretty good gauge on what's going to happen, let's say, August, September, in, and October. So here's the chart, the graphical version of it. And this number right here, the accumulated cyclone energy of 150, that's pretty important because that tells us that not only should we have a busy season with a lot of named storms and hurricane activity, but that score of 150 shows that it could be a potent season as well. In other words, we could have some pretty intense hurricanes, and that is, of course, reflected in the major hurricanes portion of Dr. Klotzbach and his team's forecast right there, which is four major hurricanes. A major hurricane, of course, is category three or higher, and those cause usually 80 percent of the damage that we see from hurricanes as a whole. So this number here, 150, that number there, major hurricanes, eight hurricanes, with a total of 17 tropical storms. And please do not discount named storms. You can get a 40 mile per hour tropical storm dumping 30, 40 inches of rain on your area, or it could just knock a tree down in your yard. We don't have any way to know how that's gonna play out. So look at these numbers and just say, okay, busy season ahead. I had better pay attention. All right, so looking at the PDF of the full report, and it is a whopping 34 pages right there, in case you're wondering. There's a lot more to this than just, eh, I think it's going to be a busy season. Dr. Klotzbach and his colleagues, which are represented here, um, and of course this is all started by the late Dr. William Gray many decades ago. It's come a long way since he started this in the 80s, I think it was. Um, so here's the PDF. This is linked off of Phil's uh, Dr. Klotzbach, I should say, want to be proper about it, his Twitter page if you want to see it. So just kind of scanning through this, uh, here again is another representation of the numbers. And then this is important too, the probability of at least one major hurricane making landfall along the entire um, U.S. coastline. Here he's broken it down into the following coastal areas. And let me just bring me back up because I want to be able to emphasize this to you. The probability of a major hurricane, not just any hurricane, but a major hurricane, the ones that really do typically the most damage, for the three different areas that we're going to look at here, for the entire U.S. coastline, 69%, which is higher than the almost coin flip, 52%, that's close to 50-50. You know, we're talking about a pretty sizable increase over the long-term average, so 69% chance according to his data, his team's data, of a major hurricane affecting somebody from Texas to Maine, all right? And that's a big deal. For the U.S. East Coast, including Florida, the peninsula, 45% chance of that happening. Uh, so almost 50-50 shot there. 
and that is above the long-term average. And then the Gulf Coast, from the Florida Panhandle to Brownsville, 44%, 14% above the long-term average of uh, 30%. So these are some important numbers in here about potential for impact. Let me just make it really clear that it is impossible. I don't care who you listen to. There's some great people out there. And you can look at steering patterns and analogs, you know, seasons that are analogous or similar to this season. All kinds of stuff out there. But you never, ever know in April, and sometimes you don't even know five days out, much less April, where they are going to end up. So just remember that. This tells us a little bit about impact, that there's a pretty decent chance that somebody's going to get a major hurricane. 69% chance of that for the U.S. coastline as a whole. So we are getting a little bit better at understanding the potential impacts, but we have a long way to go until in April we can even have a region where we know a hurricane's going to hit. So you got to pay attention. That's what this is all about. So let me scroll down using the old search function to the 38 years of past data and the analog predictors. You see it ha highlighted there in green. We'll go to the next one. Kind of cheating here, but I do want to kind of scroll through this and show you some of these analog years um, that Dr. Klotzbach and his team are looking at. And where did they go? I know they're in here somewhere. There they are. So the analog years, uh, which the, and basically this is the years that are the most similar atmospherically and oceanically right now. You know, you can look at sports and you say, well, this team is very similar to the such and such team and they won the national championship or whatever. There's just, you know, these are, not, nothing's ever going to line up perfect. But these are analog years that are similar to, you can look back and say, okay, those patterns look similar to these patterns. What years were those? Right, you understand that? So, what are those years? 1996, big impact year. 2001, eh, that wasn't so much of a big impact year from hurricanes. We had other problems that year, certainly. And then the other three really stand out, and this should get your attention. 08, big impact year. Most people forget 2008 because something else was going on called the utter collapse of the United States financial industry and the economy as a whole, the banking and the mortgage industry, all that. But Ike was huge. Gustav was huge. And we had several others in there uh, mixed into that very busy season. 2011 was pretty big as well. Irene, we were lucky, as bad as Irene was. It certainly could have been worse. Uh, so that was a busy season. At, at least, a, well, you had 19 named storms that year. And Irene was a real close call there for being a, just an incredible disaster, as bad as it was. And for the Outer Banks of North Carolina, Rodanthe and some of those areas, uh, it was very bad and in some cases historic. There's a new inlet out there and a bridge because of Irene. And then, of course, the one that should get everybody's attention is 2017. All right, so these are the analog years that most match where we're seeing things now. And so these are like puzzle pieces. Again, we talk about that a lot. This is an important chart. And we'll see how these change over time. This is the April forecast. Obviously, we will get more updates from Dr. Klotzbach and his team as we go forward. All right? So a few reasons why the uh, forecast is what it is. Uh, he says the subtropical Atlantic is generally warmer than normal, and the tropical Atlantic is near average, and the region with above normal sea surface temperature in the Atlantic correlates fairly well, this is important, with typical March sea surface temperature patterns associated with above normal hurricane seasons. So again, you go back and you look. Well, when we had other busy hurricane seasons, what did things look like in March and April that led to those busy seasons? And this is one of those indicators, all right? Uh, furthermore, another reason why they're calling for an above normal season is that there's likely to be a lack of El Nino for the most part. Now, we've got to get some new numbers here later on in the month from some of these agencies. This is the International Research Institute, part of the Climate Prediction Center. And this is the, the little arrow here is not meant to point at that particular blue. It's this time frame through here, August, September, October. 
And it's interesting, this particular plot is from the ECMWF, which calls for a pretty significant El Nino, really. Um, everything else is below that. So again, the, we've seen this before, the, the Euro uh, seasonal forecasting for the ENSO, the El Nino Southern Isolation Phenomenon, it's not been real good lately, let's just say that. Uh, and then we can just look out, and I'll show you some of the anomaly stuff in a minute. Um, generally, the Eastern Pacific, including the North Pacific, is colder than average. We're in the La Nina. Yes, it is waning, weakening, generally speaking. But the odds of El Nino, we can see that reflected very nice here. And that is what is important. No El Nino. The El Nino is the squasher if you will, the suppressing factor. Not having an El Nino is very, very important, and it does not look like we will have that in place. Um, more likely going to have neutral conditions, but we'll see. So these are some of the reasons behind uh, Colorado State's forecast for April. All right, so looking at some of the graphics that I usually show you <clears throat> in the off-season discussion, this is the wide shot, if you will, of most of the Western Hemisphere. And as you can see, a great deal of the Northern Pacific here, and even parts south of the equator, running below the long-term average. That's what those blues indicate. In the meantime, much of the Atlantic main development region at or slightly warmer than the long-term average. Northwest Atlantic quite a bit warmer than it should be, I guess if you want to say should be, normal, average, whatever you want to call it. And then let's use this link here to the actual page where I get this from, because I want to show you the Gulf and kind of zoom in on that. The Gulf of Mexico is definitely running above normal with a few areas along the edges below. And this will be important because early in the season, we could see some early activity in that area and then probably going to have a pretty quiet July. Typically you do, some big dust outbreaks happen. Everybody starts saying the season's not going to add up to anything. And then come late August, the switch gets flipped, and we'll see how all of this comes to play. But these anomalies, these departures from the long-term average are important because warmer water tends to breed more upward motion, more ridging in the atmosphere, um, more moisture, obviously, more energy. There's a lot of reasons why we look at these anomalies. And as you can see, the Western Atlantic Basin is where a lot of these positive anomalies, positive meaning above average, are located. And so we may have systems come off and turn out to sea harmlessly. Might have some that bloom late and still turn maybe near Bermuda. Didn't mean to go right over Bermuda there. Sorry, Howard. But um, you get the idea. But some are going to slip through and maybe make it into the Gulf. Maybe they'll come up out of the Caribbean. You know, we have to remember there's no way to know for sure. But... That analog of 2017, 2008, and 2011 in there in 1996, all of those years, only 2001, and we didn't have any hurricanes hit the United States that year, by the way, 01, no hurricanes hit. It wasn't until 02 uh, with Lily, I think, that we got the first landfall of the new century, the year of the 2000s. That's true. Nothing in 2000, nothing in 2001, despite busy seasons. Anyway, what we will be watching for is how does the big subtropical ridge set up. If it's extensive and connected across the Atlantic, we can get some long trackers that come all the way across. If it's fractured, we have an Atlantic ridge like this, and then a strong Azores ridge like this. You may have some getting through here, and then some that try to sneak in just off the East Coast, we don't know. We just don't know that this far out in advance. We could get some clues getting closer in, say, two to three weeks out with pressure pattern forecast, things like that. But the bottom line, it looks like a very busy hurricane season once again. And all you got to do is just make sure you stay on top of it, right? There's no reason to worry. Don't get upset about it because that does you no good. What does do you good is thinking about it understanding what you're facing, watching what happens on a daily or weekly basis, whatever suits your needs best, and then preparing when necessary. Take the actions when it's time. Don't worry about all the hype and the talk about it, and there's going to be some scary headlines you're going to see out there, I'm sure. Um, and, you know, none of that matters. What matters is what happens to you. 
on the other side of this screen here, you that I'm talking to, and we don't know what's going to happen. So let's watch it together, see how it unfolds. This is, uh, as I say often, a blessing that we have the science that can tell us this far out we could have a busy hurricane season. I think that's a good thing that we know what to look for as uh, as a species. That's pretty remarkable. All right, lower 48 weather real quick, and then I'll sign off and let you get about your day. Fairly quiet for the first full week of April here, having gone past some red flag warnings, fire weather danger in parts of the west central states, if you will, coming up from uh, New Mexico, which where, uh, is where I just flew home from, Albuquerque. Um, still breezy and dry out there. Through the Intermountain West and the Rockies, so forth and so on. Just seriously, be careful with that if you're out there. Um, red flag warnings may not seem like a big deal, but when you get those big grassland and wildland fires, it is a big deal. But at least we don't have a big severe weather threat right now. And jumping ahead and looking at the Storm Prediction Center information, Compiled nicely here from Pivotal Weather, uh, a slight risk today, enhanced tomorrow in the Deep South again. Sure seems like the traditional tornado alley out here has been pretty quiet so far, and I think that'll be mostly the case throughout the next couple of weeks. The threat shifts to the Gulf Coast states uh, two days out, and then after that, it really kind of gets quiet for the foreseeable future. And the main reason behind this sort of quiet nature to the severe weather pattern is we don't have any deep troughing. In other words, let's just look at one of these blank maps. We don't have any deep troughs cutting in the nation's midsection like this or upper lows coming out of uh, the desert southwest, as an example. Um, we basically have northwest flow across this area with a majority of the troughing east of the Mississippi. That's where most of the energy is. Uh, instead of the cold air and the boundary of the, the warm, moist air being farther to the west. Now, that might change later in April and into May. We'll see. And I'm interested in that because we want to do some testing at that point in time out on the Great Plains. We're almost to that point. All right, so a couple of things that we're working on here that I want to tell you about. I will be traveling next week, starting Sunday, going down to Florida to meet with several of our behind-the-scenes colleagues as we develop an incredible digital dashboard to display all of our camera systems, all of our weather data, we have a tremendous enhancement to our live coverage of what we're going to be doing this year. And all of that, 100% of it, is supported and funded through Patreon, our crowdfunding uh, source. Patreon is fantastic. I'm going to be talking about that more because we're doing a lot with it. Think of it like public radio the production of a huge play or musical. You have patrons, people that support it, to fund it. They do different things to make those um, productions possible. Movies, the big budget movies, you know, they have producers that help bring in the money. Patreon and the world of crowdfunding is how we do it for our stuff. And what we are doing with it, besides just the money part, yes, money is what makes the world go round, but we have a tremendous talent pool including the person that made the graphic there, Kari from over in the UK, Will Woodgate in the UK. You've heard me talk about these people before. Developing stuff in the background. Our tracking map is going to be absolutely incredible. We got a good start with it last year. Wait till you see it this year. Wait till you see the new digital dashboard. We are working on some stuff now that is absolutely revolutionary once again, and I'm so proud of it, so blessed to have so many people helping out people crowdfunding the equipment that we're using, helping out with logistics, even out in the field. It's just remarkable. So i got to go down to Florida. We're going to be working on that, meeting with different people as we put the pieces together to bring you the absolute best online hurricane coverage anywhere. And I don't boast about much. You know me over the years. It's very rare that I thump my chest and boast about anything. But I'm boasting that what we're going to throw at you this year is going to absolutely knock your socks off. And the way we support it and fund it is through Patreon. So get on there, patreon.com slash hurricane track. Become part of this incredible movement that we have got going. And you can see it from the inside out, as they say, how we do it, how we put it together. You can come along with us. You get engaged with us, become part of this community. It's just incredible. Uh, and I'll talk about it more. I'll show you. I'll, I'll do an, I'm actually going to do a video 
where I show you what we're doing and kind of give you an inside look at, what, at how the gears turn for what we're going to be doing in the 2021 hurricane season during the season coming up. All right. But anyway, next week, even though I'll be traveling, we'll have an update, keep you uh, abreast on what's going on. At least the severe weather scene looks rather tame for the foreseeable future. All right. Oh, yeah, I'm on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and all that good stuff. Hurricane Track, that is the brand name. Follow, like, subscribe, whatever. You know the drill by now. Thanks for listening to me. I do appreciate it. I will post the link to Dr. Klotz Box update in today's description. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, just keep it civil. Throw it in the YouTube comments or hit me up on Patreon on our messaging system there. And I'll talk to you through that, too. I love that. The interaction's fantastic. All right, I'm out of here. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com. I'll talk to you again next week from somewhere in Florida.